Okay, in this presentation, I'm going to be discussing um, the beginning of what we call the Protestant Reformation, um, at least as it's conventionally, um, and I think fairly well uh, understood. Um, and that's with the figure of uh, Martin Luther. Um, and I'm not going to, in this lecture or this presentation and the next presentation, I'm not going to attempt to offer a comprehensive account um, of Luther's thought. Uh, that's simply impossible to do in a survey course when you only have two sessions um, on a figure who is so uh, very important. Um, because, uh, as I'll remind you, uh, the Reformation primarily was a phenomenon concerned with the theology of justification, um, as we uh, talked about, or as I talked about um, last time, that's going to be my main uh, focus in terms of looking at Luther. Um, today, I'm going to set up kind of the, the background to Luther's thought or the background of of, of his uh, education and his influences and things like this, um, as well as some of the fundamental principles um, of his theology. Um, and then next time, uh, I'm gonna focus more specifically on the question of soteriology, um, of justification, because uh, that's the kind of most important thread for the Reformation, um, and that's what uh, we're going to pursue. Um, obviously, uh, Luther is a figure who had much to say on just about any topic um, or every topic in Christian theology. Um, when I teach my course on the Protestant Reformation, for example, I go into much more detail um, about what Luther thought about the sacraments, what he thought about uh, ecclesiology or the theology of the church, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, but today, I want to focus uh, primarily, uh, or, or I should say in, in these two talks, I want to focus primarily on justification. So um, it'll be kind of building towards a discussion of that. Um, just as a reminder as to what the readings are for today, uh, they are two uh, fairly short uh, readings from Luther, uh, the preface to the first volume of his Latin writings, which contains probably the, the clearest autobiographical statements that Luther uh, made, um, and then a few excerpts uh, from his very, very important and, and much longer than, than what you have in, in your text, um, commentary on the Galatians, uh, commentary on St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, um, which is in some ways one of the more important uh, books of the Bible for understanding um, Luther. Not quite as important as, as Romans, as I'll talk about in a bit, uh, but very important nonetheless. Um, also where you have some of the clearest elaborations of Luther's thought. Um, and once again, both of these readings are in the Hillebrandt uh, volume. I've also put them up on electronic reserve for those of you who um, forgot to bring your uh, text home. Um, before we uh, before we we had to stop uh, in person classes. Um, and before I get to the areas that I want to talk about um, in this presentation, I, I do have to say a couple of words about, in some ways, what a daunting task it is to talk about Martin Luther. Um, there are very, very few figures in uh, the Western tradition who authentically can lay claim to having changed history. Um, there are many, 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 many brilliant figures. Um, someone like Thomas Aquinas is obviously a brilliant thinker. We've seen him. Someone like Bernard of Clairvaux um, is an incredible exegete when it comes to scripture. Um, but neither of those two men changed history the way that Luther did. Um, and what this means is that it's a, a daunting task to approach him because he is so controversial um, in terms of how he is interpreted, that's to say how Luther is interpreted, um, and, and what people have made of him in the 500 and more years uh, since he entered the kind of global uh, scene. Um, one of the things I pointed out 
very early on in the course is that there was for many, many years a great divide between Protestant scholarship, uh, which tended to praise Luther, uh, even if it was written by Protestants who were not of the particular Lutheran uh, predilection. Um, nonetheless, they saw the importance of Luther um, and Roman Catholic scholarship that tended to see Luther um, as a bad thing, uh, bad, bad for uh, the history of Christianity. Um, as early as the, sixth, the late 16th century, right, the late 1500s, you have these scurrilous biographies of Luther that claim that his real father, his actual birth father, uh, was the devil for example, um, and that Luther was uh, 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 instructed by the devil later on in his life in order to, you know, produce these, the, the writings that he produced. Um, and to be honest with you, for several hundred years, although the actual demonic parentage might have been removed, um, this was the sort of general line. Uh, there was a division between Protestant and Catholic scholarship on Luther that makes it difficult to try to get to the real Luther who is uh, there, who remains there. Um, that's why in this, as in everything uh, in this course, we're only reading primary sources, um, textbooks that kind of tell you about people without presenting their writings, um, I generally find are not all that useful. Um, so we're going to try to look at Luther's writings and we're going to try to see what we can make of this incredibly uh, important individual. So today I then want to talk basically about two very broad things. Um, I first want to introduce Luther, talk about his life and, his, and times, talk about where he came from, um, what kinds of things influenced him um, so that we can begin to get a more rounded picture of the man. And second, I want to talk about some of the most important principles of Luther's thought, um, namely his idea of faith, uh, which as we're going to see becomes incredibly important and in fact central to what he's doing, um, but also his take on scripture, um, the way in which he thought scripture had to be seen as the center of Christian theology and the way in which he diagnosed the theology of his time as having abandoned that fundamental place of scripture. Okay, um, And once those two things are in place, uh, this will set up next time for us to talk about justification um, and the regenerate Christian um, so that we can see really what was most important for uh, Luther. So in terms of Luther, um, I do want to make a couple comments about his life. Um, with There are some figures historically whose lives cannot be, or, or who, who I should say whose thought cannot be studied apart from some consideration of their lives, and I, I think it's fair to say that Luther um, is one of them. Um, he uh, grew up uh, to talk about his earliest life for the moment, um, he uh, grew up in a fairly bourgeois uh, 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 family, family of burghers. Um, his father, Hans Luder, um, had destined uh, young Martin for a career in law. Um, this would be a good profession for his son to enter. Um, Unfortunately, uh, the son did not particularly like this idea. Um, he wanted to become a priest, um, and in fact, he wanted to become a, a monastic uh, priest. He wanted to become a priest in a religious order. Um, this did not sit especially well with the father, uh, who saw, you know, the possibility of his son's prosperity uh, being ruined. Um, and so, Luther uh, at first was a student of uh, law or was destined to be a student of law. Uh, and then, and this is a very famous story about Luther, uh, whether or not it's, it's true, I think hardly matters. It gives you some uh, insight into to him as a young man. Um, he was uh, walking home and he was caught in a violent uh, thunderstorm, uh, violent electrical uh, lightning uh, uh, storm. Um, and he took shelter under a tree, which I know you're not supposed to do, but 
That's what he did. Um, he took shelter from the storm under a tree, um, and he prayed to St. Anne, uh, the mother of the Virgin Mary, um, and said, uh, St. Anne, if you rescue me from this uh, catastrophe, I will dedicate my life to you by becoming a priest. Um, he survived the thunderstorm, um, and then he promptly went to tell his father that as much as he would like to go on and study the law, he had made a vow to uh, the mother of the mother of God, um, and so therefore he would have no choice but to become a priest. Um, and of course, what could his father possibly do? Um, so his father gave him his blessing um, and agreed to allow him to become a priest. And Luther entered a religious order called the Augustinian Friars. Um, it was a religious community founded in 1244. Um, you'll remember from earlier in the course that this is in the century following the foundation of the Dominicans and the Franciscans. Uh, the Augustinian Friars were similar to them. Um, they lived in a uh, cloistered, uh, uh, so kind of a, basically a, a monastic house. Uh, they used a rule uh, which is called the Rule of St. Augustine. It's one of Augustine's minor works. It was kind of a, a sketch for what a religious community would look like. Um, and this was the order uh, which Luther joined. And this was the order in which he received his earliest real theological training. Um, and I'm going to get to the specifics of this in a bit, but the Augustinian friars were, and this I don't think will surprise anyone, particularly dedicated to preserving the thought of St. Augustine. Um, and so uh, they, they kind of saw themselves as the guardians of the flame, if you will, of the great Augustine's uh, theology. Um, and this was going to affect, as we'll see in a bit, uh, the way that Luther uh, was uh, trained in theology. Uh, because it's impossible to get Luther without knowing something about his kind of mentor, um, his most important teacher uh, with whom he studied in the, among the Augustinians. And that man was Johann von Staupitz. Um, he was eventually head of the Augustinian order, um, and he was one of Luther's major teachers. Um, and as we're going to see, in a way, Staupitz, in a, in a minor way, in a vague way, prefigures a lot of the criticisms that Luther is ultimately going to make against the theology of his time. Um, and so he absorbed a lot from Staupitz. Um, I should say later in life, Staupitz, uh, uh, by the time Staupitz was older, uh, Luther had come into his own, the Reformation had uh, started, and, and Staupitz uh, uh, repudiated the Reformation um, and, you know, said he probably shouldn't have taught Luther all of those uh, things. Um, but regardless of how he felt later in life, um, Staupitz's ideas that he was teaching, the ideas that were in the air, were very important for Luther's coming criticism of the uh, theology of his time. And at the time in the university, um, there was a distinction or various people in the university made a distinction uh, between two modes of theology as uh, they were practiced. Uh, they were, they were, would often refer to the via moderna, which means the modern, and, and modern, the word modern means current. It means what's going on at this moment now. Um, it's why, for example, in uh, French, la mode uh, means fashion, uh, means what's being done uh, now. So the via moderna was the term used to describe the nominalist theologians whom we met last time. People like Gabriel Beale, uh, for example, were seen as part of the via moderna. Those of you who have done some study of philosophy, uh, William of Ockham uh, 
uh, was another figure associated with the Via Moderna. These were thinkers primarily from the 14th uh, or mid 14th century um, up until the late 15th century, um, who were referred to as the Via Moderna. Staupitz, on the other hand, uh, saw himself as part of the Via Antiqua or the ancient way. Um, and what they argued they were doing, okay, was returning to a truer form of Augustine's thought. They identified Augustine's thought as the classic mode of Christian theology. Um, and they saw what they were doing as returning to that particular uh, type of theology. They were getting back to the best way to do things, right? Um, I, I know sometimes if you look at the words in Latin, it might look like the antique way. And we have a tendency when we think of antique to think of something that's kind of old and maybe not in great uh, repair. Um, but... Uh, what they saw themselves as doing was getting back to real Christian theology without the kind of accretion of things, uh, particularly from philosophy, um, that had been uh, added to that theology. Um, and one of the things that Staupitz took particular umbrage of, and, and uh, umbrage with, I should say, and that Luther would follow him in, was that he looked at the theology of the nominalists, the ones we saw last time, those of Beale, and he said, really, this notion of life as, of the Christian life as the via viator, as the pilgrim's way, um, with all of these merits, these condign uh, and congruent merits, he said, what we seem to be doing is saying, over the course of my life, I, make myself look more attractive to God, okay? Um, and, and again, as we saw with anomalous, that's not a terrible characterization of their thought. But what Staupitz saw as dangerous about this was that that seemed to suggest that God changed his mind, right? Because before, when we were, before we had earned any merits or before we'd been put in the state of grace and these kinds of things, God had, um, uh, you know, said we're, you know, had condemned us or would have condemned us, right? But then over the course of time, we managed to change God's opinion of us, right, by doing more good things. And Staupitz said, this is a real problem. The notion of God changing his mind is very, very, very problematic. Instead, Staupitz said, it should be that what changes is not God's perception of us, because that would mean that God changes, but our perception of God, okay? And we're going to see, once we get to Luther's doctrine of justification at the end, you know, in the course of these two presentations, we're going to see how important that is for Luther, that the change that takes place through grace isn't in God, right? because that's impossible. The change that takes place is in us, and we begin to understand God differently. So that was one of Staupitz's criticisms that Luther learned. Um, that was one of Staupitz's criticisms of the nominalists, of the Via Moderna, was that they seemed to make God into a changeable being. The second thing that Staupitz saw as problematic with the theology of his time was he saw that scripture had been displaced, okay? Yes, to be sure, the nominalists still uh, quoted scripture, they still cited scripture, but Staupitz said, really, they're doing it just as kind of providing little quote-unquote proof texts. Um, they're not really reading the scripture with an open mind and an open heart and really embracing the message. And so as a result, Staupitz claimed, problems about being and problems about philosophy had, had become much more important than the real scripture. And so Staupitz taught Luther and taught his students that scripture had to be returned to the centrality of Christian thought. And that if that were not the case, 
then Christian theology would be uh, would become detrimental. Um, that there that would be the problem. That would be the reason for the problems in Christian theology um, would be a lack of uh, attention to Scripture, which has to be at the center. And so this is what Luther learned from Staupitz. But he tells us uh, in these few autobiographical writings he has that the moment for him, the real moment for Luther um, came in reading seriously the Epistle to the Romans. Now we've talked about the Epistle to the Romans, not about it as a, as a primary text, but we've talked about its importance to Christian theology. Think back to Augustine and the Spirit and the Letter, or look back in your text and see how often Augustine returns to the Epistle to the Romans, right? This is probably the book of the Bible about which the most has been written in all of the history of Christianity. And Luther was studying the Epistle to the Romans because, of course, his great master, Augustine, right, the, the great master had de dedicated so much time to Romans. And so Luther was, you know, thinking I should study Romans very carefully. And suddenly he was struck by one verse. Romans chapter uh, uh, 1, verse 17. For the justice of God, justitia Dei, for the justice of God is revealed therein from faith unto faith, as it is written, the just man liveth by faith. And this notion of the justice of God, okay, um, the uh, uh, justice uh, from God, we talked about this when we talked about Augustine, um, and the centrality of faith in terms of what it means to be the just man, to be the justus, to be the good person, um, was for Luther a stunning moment. In this moment, he felt that scripture was basically knocking him on the head and bringing him back to his senses. Um, that's not an, an, an in, inopportune metaphor because uh, Luther, as we're going to see, often thought of scripture as doing just that. Scripture is what breaks through our hard headedness, breaks through our thick headedness um, and gets us to confront reality. And then this moment here um, is for Luther um, the crucial, or this verse, I should say, is for Luther the crucial verse notion of the righteousness of God or the justice of God, justitia Dei. This is the key verse for the whole of the Bible. This for him is the center. Every other verse of the Bible makes sense for Luther if you read it through the lens of, first of all, the larger argument of the epistle to the Romans, but more specifically, this one verse. This is the, you know, Schlusstein, or this is the keystone um, of the whole interpretation um, of, uh, um, of, the, of Scripture, uh, and therefore of reality, uh, for Luther. Um, and he notes in this autobiography that I've uh, asked you to, the little autobiographical writing I said, I've asked you to look at, um, He's describing what he was like before he read this verse. Now remember, Luther is writing this near the end of his life. He's looking back on this time, um, and he's looking at it, again, through the lens of someone who has had a real kind of conversion moment. So you have to take it as with all autobiographical writings, um, you know, with a measure um, of salt. Um, but he says here, right, though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt that I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that he was placated by my satisfaction. I did not love, yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners and secretly, if not blasphemously, certainly murmuring greatly, I was angry with God. And so the discovery of the importance of that verse in Romans was what got Luther to understand that everything, almost everything he'd been doing up until that moment was wrong, okay? 
Now, I, I should point out that this moment, it's often referred to as the, the tower uh, 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 moment for a variety of reasons, has been interpreted in many, many ways throughout, um, uh, throughout history. Um, some of them obviously quite uh, uh, triumphalist, right? Those who see this moment as the moment in which in some ways God speaks to Luther and therefore he begins the glorious process of reformation. Um, it's been seen very derisively, obviously, uh, or as you can imagine, I should say, Catholic historians have often suggested that perhaps this was in fact the devil tempting uh, 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 Luther towards this in this particular way. And sometimes it's been interpreted in ways that are downright goofy. Um, there was there is a book by a, a guy named Eric Erickson. Uh, this came out, I believe, in the 50s uh, called Young Man Luther. Um, and it came out in a period when there was a, the rage for something called psychohistory, which is the you write history by trying to create a psychological portrait of the people of whom you're writing history. Now, by and large, we don't do this anymore because it doesn't make any sense. All you have is someone's writings. You can't put them on your, you know, leather couch and, and in interrogate them, right? Um, but Erickson uh, sees this moment, he reads it through a Freudian lens, and he sees this moment as the moment in which uh, Luther passes into his, from his ego into his super ego, um, and this is the moment where you know um, Luther enters maturity. All of these kinds of things. He he provides all kinds of salacious uh, details as well. Um, but regardless of how you interpret this moment, whether you think it was great, whether you think it was terrible, um, whether you think it was something that can be diagnosed like a clinical physician, um, it's an important moment for. Um, Luther. Okay, it's the turning point for Luther in terms of his thinking. And in fact, Luther decided that what he needed to do was he needed to go against the prevailing theological orthodoxy of his time. And like Staupitz, he saw the problem as having to do primarily with a forgetfulness of scripture and an over uh, an over dependence on philosophy in other words not really starting theologically starting philosophically and making philosophy the critic of theology rather than the other way around and luther saw this as fundamentally problematic and he thought more than anything else, the use of Aristotle was what was leading people astray. Not per se necessarily because Aristotle had been a quote unquote pagan, but rather because he thought Aristotle introduced all kinds of confusing categories that basically had the effect of confusing the mind or dazzling the mind with all of these philosophical fireworks. Um, and so people were missing the real theological issues because they were getting lost in the fantasies of Aristotelian philosophy. And he thought that scholastic theology, the theology of the schools, right? The theology of people like Gabriel Beale, for example, had gone wrong precisely because of a problem with the method the use of Aristotle, the overdependence as well on dialectical thought. Think about someone like Thomas Aquinas here, for example. Um, and so Luther decided what he was going to do was he was going to post a series of resolutions, a series of propositions in which he would attack scholastic theology and Aristotelian philosophy. And he would do it in such a way that he would invite the public basically to come debate with him. You know, he would basically say, he would, you know, give a list of propositions and he would say, you know, in which he was very critical of theology, the theology of his time. Um, but then he would invite people to come in and uh, debate with him so that they could get to the bottom of the issue. And these were 97, yes, 97 theses, uh, which he called disputations against scholastic theology. 
And he posted these publicly. He's in Wittenberg at the university. He posted these publicly in September of 1517. And he was expecting that all of the masters of the university would be up in arms. They would say, how dare you attack our uh, dedicate, you know, our um, uh, 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 wonderful method of theology and what do you know and you're just an upstart uh, uh, young uh, uh, scholar and how you know how can you possibly imagine uh, that you would be able to uh, challenge us in that way he posted these theses and nobody paid attention to them nobody paid attention to them um, like college towns and university towns from the 13th century up until the 21st every possible spot where you could post something had a million things posted on it and eventually as i think probably all of you know you just get used to walking past a board with a bunch of things on it and maybe there's something new maybe there's not you don't pay too much attention to it so this radical proposal uh the very radical proposals in fact in the 97 theses against scholastic theology fell on deaf ears But Luther was not to be deterred. And to explain how it was that Luther ultimately came into the public attention, I need to talk about um, another uh, individual. This is a figure by the name of Johann Tetzel. Um, <clears throat> now, um, at the time, the Roman church was uh, beginning plans to, excuse me, to build what would ultimately become St. Peter's Basilica. It was going to be, it was going to be uh, designed by Michelangelo Bonarotti. It was going to be the most beautiful church in the world. In fact, it, it still exists to today, if you're not familiar with it. Um, however, this required money. Um, and so uh, various provinces, um, were assigned individuals whose job was to oversee those who would go around from church to church and town to town and collect money so that St. Peter's Basilica could be constructed. Um, and these were seen as, I, we've talked a little bit about this uh, in the past and before the break as well, um, these were seen as good works donating money to uh, someone like Johann Tetzel's collection um, was seen as a good work. Just as in the, in the earlier medieval period, if you couldn't go on pilgrimage, you would pay someone to go on pilgrimage for you. That would be your good work, would be paying someone to go on pilgrimage. And so here, paying money to Tetzel or to one of Tetzel's flunkies, if you will, um, was seen to be a good work, um, and it carried with it a forgiveness of sins from the Pope himself, it, what was known as a papal indulgence, okay? Um, just as you would have received if you'd gone on crusade, just as you would have received um, if you'd made a very particular pilgrimage. So by financing this thing of beauty, this, this honor, uh, this thing which would honor the Lord, um, you were seen as having done a good work. Now, we don't know much about Tetzel's methods for selling the indulgences or how he, um, how he advertised them. Um, much of what we have comes from chronicles written by Protestant authors later who have done their best to make Tetzel look like a kind of greasy uh, used car salesman from Yonkers type character, okay? Um, maybe he was, right? Um, however, it's important when thinking about Tetzel and thinking about the uh, sale of indulgences, um, it's important to know that, again, much of our information comes from sources that may not be the most unbiased possible sources. Um, but at least in the at least in the um, uh, 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 the legends, um, this particular I've put it on the the screen. Um, this particular couplet has come to be 
uh, associated with uh, Tetzel, which is Zobal der Pfenning in Kashtin Klingt, die Zelle aus dem Fegfeuer springt. Or, or each time a coin within the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Um, the notion here, of course, being that he was telling people you can buy your deceased loved ones out of purgatory and into heaven for a few coins. Now, Luther, in thinking about Tetzel, okay, was horrified, right? But he wasn't horrified for the reasons that one might immediately think. Um, Luther, as I said at the beginning of, of last lecture and kind of orienting the Reformation, Luther didn't think that Tetzel was corrupt, or maybe he did think that Tetzel and those like him were corrupt, um, but that wasn't really his problem. Um, Luther always maintained to the end of his life that there were always going to be corrupt people in the church. Um, there would be good people, there'd be corrupt people, the church is simply uh, 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 like that. Um, what troubled Luther, what outraged him, was this notion that you could do something to alter your salvation, that you could bring about your justification, not just through money, it wasn't just because it was money, it wasn't because someone was profiting, but by any kind of act that you somehow could earn God's grace. And as we're going to see next time, this is going to become the heart of Luther's theology, the notion that you can't do anything to earn grace, whether it is by doing good deeds, you know, being charitable, for example, or, or you know, clothing the, the, the naked, feeding the hungry, right? No, that can't earn you salvation. Praying, right? Doing rosaries, novenas, you know, uh, uh, undertaking ascetic acts like wearing hair shirts and, you know, uh, uh, going around barefoot. No, that can't do it. And neither can giving money to the church. So that's really what Luther's beef with Tetzel was. So Luther decided again to draw up a series of propositions this time against the practice of selling indulgences. And this time he was much smarter because first of all, he picked a topic that was more pertinent, that was more in the news, right? Just as now some of us will look at Tetzel and say, oh, he's hoodwinking people by trying to quote unquote, sell them salvation. Not everyone thinks that, but you know, some might think that. At the time, because people are basically the same, whether it's the 16th century or the 21st century, at the time there were people that were suspicious of it as well. So Luther already knew that there were people who uh, maybe didn't think Tetzel was entirely on the up and up. But also this time, Luther knew that on November 1st, 1517, okay, uh, all, uh, uh, all Saints Day, that um, the Duke was coming to uh, Wittenberg with his collection of relics. And we talked about relics uh, before when we were talking about the Middle Ages. Um, Roland Bainton, in his very famous biography, Young Man Luther, uh, claims that somewhere between uh, 15 and 40,000 relics would be on display at the cathedral at Wittenberg. Um, one of my old uh, teachers as an undergrad used to refer to this as an ecclesiastical Disneyland. Um, so Luther knew that this big event was coming, that everyone was going to be going to the cathedral to see uh, these uh, relics. Um, and so on October 31st, 1517, uh, the day before All Saints Day and two days before All Souls Day. All Souls Day is, is November 2nd. Luther nailed 95 theses against the practice of indulgences to the door of the cathedral where everybody could see it. Okay. And immediately this got everyone's eye. Um, this got everyone talking about the young uh, scholar from um, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Wittenberg, who had challenged some of the core doctrines of the church, because even though he was 
attacking the practice of indulgences in general, which of course the the church didn't particularly care for. It doesn't look good for your indulgence um, uh, industry if uh, uh, people are attacking it as somehow opposed to Christian doctrine. But he seemed to be saying at a fundamental level that the theology of the Christian church was Pelagian, right? And we all know from earlier in the course that Pelagian is a bad word, okay? And so this is often the moment that people date to the beginning of the Reformation. Um, in fact, I believe it is still uh, some semi-officially celebrated in some corners. October 31st um, is uh, uh, the uh, is Reformation Day, um, in addition to being um, Halloween as well. Um, once dressed up as Martin Luther for Halloween, therefore satisfying both of those uh, days at once, I suppose. Um, but this really is the moment uh, at which Luther emerges and we begin to speak of the Reformation. Um, I want to just talk about two more events in Luther's life, which are important, um, and then I want to get into some of the principles of his thought. Um, the first of these is that on June 15th, 1520, Pope Leo X publishes a papal bull. We've talked about papal bulls. These are official uh, declarations by the Pope speaking for the church um, called Exurge Domine, uh, which was a formal condemnation of Luther. Um, Luther, I should note, receiving this, uh, publicly burned his copy of the bull um, and also burned uh, several volumes of canon law, church law as well, I guess just for, for good measure. Um, I often actually think of 1520, of this moment in 1520, uh, in my own thinking, in my own scholarship on the issue, I, I think about this as the real beginning of the Reformation, right? Uh, 1517 to 1520, no one's quite sure what to make of Luther. Is he a heretic? Is he an error? There are a couple of public disputations. But once you get to 1520, Leo says the church doesn't want to have anything to do with you and luther says i don't want to have anything to do with your so-called quote church this is the point of no return all right this is the point where everybody knows the stakes are high everybody's all in um so i think of it as a major major moment um in luther's life um another uh uh thing that uh happens is that he is uh that he becomes married he gets married to Katharina von Bora. Uh, who was a former nun, 1525. Um, I should note, by the way, that as far as we can tell, Luther had no interest in marrying. Um, he, he thought that the church's prohibition on married clerics was perfectly legitimate. It had been the way he'd always uh, lived in the 42 or so years up until that point. Um, his father pressured him to marry a Catalina uh, because he thought that it would be a kind of bold move. It would be the kind of thing that would really rub it in the 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 Romans, uh, the Roman cat, the, the the Roman church's um, uh, face. Um, again, seems to have been a happy marriage. Uh, we don't know much. We don't know too much um, about it. Okay. I want to talk now about some of the basic principles of Luther's thought, uh, particularly uh, faith and um, scripture. But before I do that, I want to talk about reform and reformation and what it meant to Luther. Um, and it's something that he doesn't really explicitly articulate in his thought, but we, we can get it from the way in which he deals with this question. And it's important to know as well, if, if you don't, that Luther never set out to found a group called the Lutherans, okay? It was only the enemies of Luther, primarily the Roman church, primarily the Catholics, who referred to Luther and his group as quote unquote Lutherans, in the same way they referred to those who seemed to have Pelagius' thought as Pelagians, in the same way they referred to those who seemed to follow uh, Arius of Alexandria as Arians, right? Um, it was an attempt to confine Luther and, his, and those who agreed with him to the narrow box of heresy, okay? 
Um, if you'd asked Luther, are you, are you and your people Lutherans? He would have said, no, we're Christians, right? If you'd ask the Catholic Church, are, if you'd ask, you know, the, 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 the Vatican, are Luther's people Christians? They would have said, no, they're heretics. They're a heretical group called Lutherans. So Luther saw himself as out to not, quote unquote, break away from the church. You must never think of Luther as having done that. Luther wanted to restore the church. The problem was, as far as he could see it, the Roman church had fallen into theological error. It had become a heretical group, right? Um, and so for Luther, it's the teaching of the church that defines if it's the true church, not the visible elements, not the fact that there's a pope or that there are cardinals or bishops or priests or, you know, or that, 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 that the physical church buildings exist. For, for Luther, that's secondary. That's, that's man-made, right? For Luther, doctrine, teaching, proper understanding of scripture, that's what made the church. So Luther would argue that he was not breaking away from the church, that the church had already broken away from true doctrine. He, he dated it to around the year five or 600 or so. He basically thought for a thousand years or so, the church had been in error. So Luther wasn't breaking away from the church. He was breaking away from the heretical group that called itself the church. Okay, because it was teaching Pelagianism. It was teaching the wrong doctrine about justification. And so what Luther was doing was he was returning to the true church. And in fact, he, and his, he called himself and his father, uh, followers the Evangelica Kirka, the evangelical church, that's to say the gospel church, right, which is the true church in that way. Okay, and this is an important thing to keep in mind with Luther. He didn't see himself as starting a new movement. He didn't see himself as breaking away. He didn't see himself as being a quote unquote Protestant. That was another term that was imposed uh, upon these groups by, by others, right? He didn't see himself as creating the Lutherans, right? He saw himself as restoring the church, okay? As returning to the true church. And it didn't matter for, for him if there was you know, a hundred people in the, you know, the, the, what he thought of as the fake church for every one person in his movement or a thousand, right? The size of the group didn't matter, right? He remembered the, the story of Athanasius of Alexandria when he was supposedly the lone voice crying out against Arianism, right? Luther said, it's true doctrine that makes the true church, not numbers, not visibility, not trappings, okay? So I want first to talk about faith. Um, and this is a key concept for Luther's anthropology and his soteriology. Um, the word for faith in Latin, and Luther, most of what Luther wrote was in Latin. He has some minor German works, but his major theological works were, of course, in Latin. He gave his lectures in, in, in Latin and whatnot, um, is fides. Now, this is the term that we use to believe something. We, we use it in the broadest sense. Um, it can mean any number of things. It can mean affirmation of a proposition. So, you know, if, if I give you the proposition, all men are mortal, and you say, I believe that, okay, then that is a type of fides. That's a type of belief. If the church says, for example, um, on the third day, uh, Christ rose, Christ descended into hell and rose again, right, as it says in the creed, and you say, I believe that, that is a type of fides. Um, and Luther felt that by his time, the notion of faith had lost its real strength. Okay, it had been too much uh, an epistemological issue. That's to say an issue in your philosophy of knowledge. Okay, uh, for example, the church at the time often talked about what they called fides implicita or implicit faith. In other words, I say, I believe what the church teaches, and even if I don't know all the ins and outs of transubstantiation or, you know, um, uh, doctrine of baptism, if, even if I don't know that, by simply saying I affirm that the church is true or the church's doctrine is true, I have an implicit faith in all the particulars, okay? And Luther thought this notion of faith 
robbed it of its real strength. When he saw faith in Romans, right, in the epistle to the Romans, we saw that quote earlier, Luther said it's not fides in that epistemological sense, in that sense of knowing something or believing a proposition. It's more like, and I've put the word up there on the screen, fiducia, trust. It's a trust not just that you give intellectually to a proposition, but it's the type of subjective. In other words, it's located in you, okay? Um, you are giving your trust into someone else, right? Um, for example, uh, you can almost think of this in existential terms, right? Uh, uh, you, you are on uh, an airplane uh, that's going down and someone's got a, uh, uh, a parachute, right? And says, uh, listen, I got this parachute. I know what I'm doing. Strap yourself into me. I'll get you down there, right? The trust that you have for that person, right? Think about that type of trust, right? It's a trust not just by you saying, yes, I believe you might know something about parachutes. I believe you might. No, you are literally giving your full being over to that person, okay? And Luther says, this is the type of faith that we have to have. Okay, it's not just saying, oh, I believe that what Jesus did on the cross was enough, you know, for everyone. It's not just affirming that proposition. It's literally trusting in it, trusting your, entrusting your life to it, okay? Um, and this is his, um, these, this is his implication for soteriology, okay? And we're going to come back to this later on, but we need first to... We need to start thinking about how faith fa factors into that. Uh, we'll remember that soteriology is one's theory um, of salvation, okay? And Luther says, you have to trust with the full of your being. You have to trust that what Christ did was enough and that there's nothing that can be added to it. Remember at the end of the last presentation, I said that Luther, when he learned the theology of someone like Gabriel Beale, right, and this notion of condign and congruent merits and God, you know, facientibus quod in se es Deus non denigat gratiam and all of these kinds of things. Luther looked at that and he looked at how much uh, humanity could do and then he looked at God dying on the cross and said, man, if God had to die for us, then the situation must have been terrible, right? It must have been terrible, so terrible uh, that there's nothing we can do, and so terrible that the only person who could do it was God. And if you think back to Anselm, St. Anselm and the Cur Deus Homo, right? This is, Luther is exactly in line with what Anselm is saying, right? Luther is saying Christ was sufficient. God dying was enough, and you have to trust that, okay? And you can't betray that you're not trusting it by saying, well, yeah, I, I trust it was enough, but, you know, I'm going to do these things anyway, because what's the harm, right? Luther says, no, there is harm in trying to do all these other things to improve yourself, because you, then you're demonstrating that in a real existential way, you don't trust that it was enough. And so for Luther, faith is something that's more than intellectual. It's something subjective. It's something affective. It's something in uh, the will itself. Um, and it's sort of very difficult um, to get around uh, faith in Luther. Okay, so that's the first kind of principle of Luther's thought, right? He discovered that right in his reading of Romans, that faith didn't mean what the scholastic thinkers thought it meant, right? It meant something real, it meant something personal, it meant something subjective, uh, meaning deep um, and, and in some ways uh, irreducible um, within the self. Equally important, of course, for Luther as a principle, as the background to his thought, is his doctrine of scripture, okay? Now, we'll remember 
the four uh, medieval senses of scripture. I know we talked both about the threefold and the fourfold method, but by Luther's time, the fourfold method, the one we associate in, in the course, at least with, with um, Ambrose, uh, has come to dominate uh, the uh, uh, dominate the scene. Um, and if we we'll remember the way that the um, the way that the uh, 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 medievals read scripture was not only through the fourfold method, but was the notion that the church was in existence to help you understand the Bible, right? The institutional church, right, with the pope as the head and the bishops and the clergy, that their job was to guard the right sense of scripture. Now, Luther took umbrage with this in a very serious way. First, with the medieval senses of scripture. He said, the problem is that the allegorical senses or the spiritual senses, the allegorical, the moral, the anagogical, all of these complicate the matter, right? And he said, and if you read the commentators on scripture, for them, the literal sense is the least important, the, the plain sense, he liked to call it. The, he said, that's the sense you just kind of go, go through quickly in two lines. He said, and you spend, you know, 20 pages on the allegorical, 15 pages on the moral, 35 pages um, on the anagogical, right? And he said, what's happening here, he says, is that uh, um, you're speculating. You're kind of going off and, and you're really becoming more of uh, something where you are talking about your, yourself and kind of just kind of riffing more than you're looking at the plain sense. And Luther says, look, the literal sense of scripture, the plain sense is obvious to everyone, right? That is the clear sense of scripture, okay? That's what we have to look at. He says, forget the allegorical sense, forget the moral sense, forget the anagogical sense. All of those things, insofar as they are true, are available in the literal sense. Okay, and that's the way in which you have to read the text. And moreover, he says, scripture has to be at the center of theology. Okay, you can't use what Thomas Aquinas says about being, right, when he's talking philosophically, as a way to interpret scripture. He says, no, no, no. Scripture has to be what judges whether theology or philosophy is good. And if it doesn't accord with what scripture says, he says, then it's bad theology or bad philosophy. Okay. Um, now, Luther, by the way, is not someone who says, well, then you just put a Bible in the hands of everybody and anyone can interpret scripture the way he or she wants to. No, 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 no. Luther's, Luther's not a lunatic fringe uh, a, a character thinking you can just kind of read scripture and understand it. He says, you have to be trained to do this. He saw himself, since he had been trained in Bible, in theology at the university, he saw himself as capable of doing it. He said, you also have to listen to other theologians, good theologians, Augustine, right? Most of all, Augustine. He said, that doesn't mean that theologians, simply by virtue of being old and famous, are necessarily right. He said, there are some that are greater that are right most of the time. Augustine is the classic example. He said, there are some, though, that people tend to take their opinions on the books simply because they're sort of, quote unquote, classics or, you know, they're the old masters. Luther says, no, no, no. If they're not getting scripture right, you have to do away with them. OK, so for Luther, what you need to have is you need scripture at the center of theology because scripture is the only thing that is going to provide you with your theology. Everything else is secondary to scripture. To the extent that it is a good reading of scripture, like you say, find a lot in Augustine, good, terrific. Okay. Um, and in fact, the early Lutheran Bibles, the, the early Bibles produced by Luther's followers, were printed with a commentary of excerpts from classic theologians, Augustine, Jerome, Ambrose, um, all of these great guys that we have uh, uh, looked at, right? But they were picked by what Luther thought were examples of those, those men reading scripture correctly, okay? And Luther saw himself since he was a doctor in theology, just as all of those other teachers were often referred to as the doctores ecclesiae, the doctors of the church, Luther saw himself as in continuity uh, 
with those other thinkers. So Luther had a place at the table just like Augustine did in some ways. But scripture's got to be at the center of things. Okay? And this is what Luther means by his famous principle, sola scriptura, by scripture alone. Not that you don't need to study any theology at all, right? He's not saying, oh yeah, no, 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 just you know, do away with, or, or you know, uh, there's no need to study anything that's not scripture. No, no, no. Luther's point here is that scripture has within it everything you need for salvation, okay? That scripture is sufficient. And if you compare this, just as a, just as a point of comparison, of retrospective, with what Thomas Aquinas says at the very beginning of the Summa Theologiae, right? Where he says that scripture is what completes natural knowledge, right? Natural knowledge can only get you so far. It can do some good things, but you know, it can only go so far. It needs to be supplemented by scripture. You need to be kind of lifted up by scripture. Luther in some ways is going against that. Luther is saying no. It's got to be scripture, scripture first. Everything else, um, as we will uh, uh, see, um, is problematic in that way. So that's what Luther has to say about faith and about scripture. Um, I just wanna say a few words uh, to introduce the topic for next time, which is justification, the, 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 central, the central concern um, of Luther's thought. And this is where Luther really confronted the late medieval nominalists. Um, this was the key quest. This is the key question for every Christian. How are we saved? Okay, for Luther, that's what Christianity comes down to, right? Yes, there are other important questions. There's the questions of what is the church? Where is the church? What are the sacraments? You know, can we have natural knowledge of God? All of these kinds of things are good questions, Luther would say. But the central one is the one that each Christian has to struggle with, which is how can we be saved? Okay, the question of justification and the question of what we call quote unquote righteousness or sometimes justice. Both of these terms, as we talked about much earlier in the course, translate justitia. Okay, um, so the question is how we make good on the atonement, right? Think back to Anselm, right? The atonement by, through Christ's sacrifice. And as I said, I've said a number of times, Luther's starting point for this, and this is what he tells us, is the cross. It has to be the cross. It has to be the notion that God suffered and died on account of our sin. Okay? So we have to measure how sinful we are by how... Um, how severe the remedy is, just as you, you can measure how serious an illness is by how severe the remedy is, right? If all that your illness requires is uh, Tylenol or something like that, it's not a big illness, right? If it requires extensive chemotherapy, it's, it's a very serious illness, okay? So if we apply this principle, if Christ, you know, who is God, has to die, right? If that's the only remedy, then we are really messed up, okay? So your doctrine of humanity, your anthropology, and we'll talk about this next, I'll talk about this next time, has to be adequate to the medicine, okay? If we weren't too bad, Luther says, God would have just sent an inst instructional manual or something like this, right? Or put a couple of good ideas in a couple people's heads, right? Um, so all of your theology has to be adequate to the cross. And this is where Luther saw the worst, or what he identified as the worst part of late medieval nominalism. He saw, you know, ultimately, uh, he looked at the system of someone like Gabriel Beale um, and this notion of uh, accumulating uh, congruent and then condign uh, merits. Um, and he said, well, you know, this, this whole concept um, faciantibus quod in se est, Deus non denigat gratiam suam, you know, uh, from those who do what is within them, God will not withhold uh, God's grace, okay? Um, he said, all of this really gives a lot of credit to uh, the human person, 
Um, and so he referred to it as a theologia gloriae, a theology of glory. And, and he meant this as, as, a, as a, a, a bad thing. Okay, he didn't mean it was a glorious theology or a wonderful theology, a theology to be glorified. No, no, no. He said it's a theology of glory because it glorifies man, right? By saying, you know, quote in say est, right? Um, ultimately, what you're saying is that uh, uh, we have it in us to do this, okay? We have this capacity in us. And so you're saying humanity is wonderful. You're really sort of raising humanity. And he says, that's not adequate to what we know about God's suffering on the cross, okay? And so instead of a theology of glory, Luther says, what you always must have in Christian theology is a theologia crucis, a theology of the cross, right? A theology that takes as its first principle the fact that God had to suffer and die on account of the human condition, on account of how sinful human beings uh, were and are, Okay? And so that's where you have to begin for Luther, is with the cross. And you have to try to figure this out. You have to try to understand this, you know, not through uh, philosophy or human reason or something like that, because you can't in a way. You can't understand the immensity of the situation or the depths of human sin. Only scripture, sola scriptura, can give you the insight into where you need to begin your theology, which is with the fact of the cross. Okay, so for next time, as I said, we'll turn to the question of justification, and we'll see how Luther's theology, starting with the cross and pursued through scripture, um, ultimately uh, works itself out. Okay, thank you.